AI? Do you mean another interesting video by me? <laughs> Have you ever heard about technological singularity? It refers to a theoretical future time at which computer intelligence surpasses that of humans. Anyway, I learned about this subject through Reddit, where I stumbled onto r slash singularity. And what a subreddit it is. <laughs> but apart from funny memes and super interesting AI developments, perhaps what I find most compelling are the discussions going on down there. Quoting, you see, your humanity, everything that makes you human, is based on one lived experience, your own. AIs will be based on thousands or millions of lived experiences, so it will be more human than even the most human of humans. Interesting take, I'll leave it right there. Anyway, I believe life is all about experiencing and learning. And as we speak, somewhere, some algorithm is being trained. So before AI takes over, I'm going to attempt to take over AI. We go at this in five chapters. Disclaimer, I'm no programmer, no scientist, no AI expert. I know nothing about anything, but I just wanted to approach this topic with an open mind and I hope you enjoy. I have a dilemma. I can't seem to function anymore without the help of ChatGPT. It's gotten to the point where every email I write gets reworded better and every text and story I have to write for my actual day job gets written nice and professional with these facts I give you now. And I've been using this technology for only a little over a year. I got introduced to this back in my undergraduate degree when a friend of mine told me she writes all of her essays with ChatGPT and I was like, what the hell, you can actually do this and get away with it? I feel like writing is just such a human task. Back in school, I would simultaneously love and dread writing, but it never even occurred to me to outsource a task because back then the the world I lived in had no such option. In a way, it feels like I'm cheating my own creative agency by having an algorithm write text for me. But I live in a world now where this has seemingly become normal in such a short amount of time, and it is either adapt or give my job to someone who is more tech savvy than me. Welcome to the future. We have AI on your phone. Before you engage in conversation, would you please talk to our chatbot? And also, do you want to try our AI-generated burger? AI right now is a buzzword, one where we can't yet imagine the lasting outcome in the following years. But there are two main things holding it back right now. One, the lack of data, and two, the lack of energy. Data is the lifeblood of AI. Machine learning algorithms need vast amount of data to learn patterns, make predictions, and improve their algorithms. Without sufficient high-quality data, AI systems cannot perform or improve. The scarcity of data, privacy concerns, and accessibility issues significantly impede advancement of AI technology. I mean, if you trained your system on all the knowledge of Google, then how do you get more and more data to actually train it on? And to further quell any GAI or general artificial intelligence dreams or dystopias, we still also lack the energy to actually make that happen, to make an AI that is so advanced that it is like able to take over humans. I think many of us, me included, can't even begin to imagine the amount of energy needed to train sophisticated AI models. For example, if we in theory scale up GPT in the same way it has been progressing so far, training AI models like GPT-6 or GPT-8, which could approach or surpass human intelligence, would require astronomical amounts of energy, far beyond what current global energy infrastructure is able to handle. GPT-6 would need about 10% of the entire US grid's power output, whilst a hypothetical GPT-8 would require more energy than the total electricity generating capacity of the world. Wow. So essentially, we're not just lacking the data to make GAI happen, we're also lacking the energy to make it happen. Or if we make it happen, whatever, and just push through because we're tech giants and have a lot of money, then we're going to create a resource and sustainability problem for the whole world. I don't know who wants that because I don't want that. To understand the system, you have to understand the system. So I'm going to learn how to build an AI. <laughs> when I was first thinking about what I wanted my AI to do, I, I got like a really crazy, just quick idea. And then like I just started pursuing it and that's how we ended up here. See, to me, boy bands feel AI generated, crafted by companies using a copy and paste approach to achieve global and commercial appeal. So I introduce to you the boy band AI project made by me. This concept has two parts, the band name and the visual, motivated by me wanting to understand text-based and image generating code, because I feel like those are the two really big things right now, you know, like things that generate text or like words in my case, because let's make it a little bit easier, at least for me. And then of course, image generating AI. And before all of these parts stand a challenge learning how to code. Well, actually, I do know basic HTML and JavaScript for my beginner's guide to visual coding in university, but Python is something I had to learn from zero this year. But it is the most used language for machine learning due to its simplicity, readability, and vast amounts of frameworks that you could implement in it. Also, it makes it a little bit easier to test out because I could just like test it out on my Mac terminal. Imagine you're a cook who wants to create a new recipe and you have a cookbook with a bunch of amazing recipes in it, but you want to learn how to mix your ingredients in a new way so that they create a recipe that is just as good as the ones in the cookbook. And before all of this, 
you need the ingredients, of course. So the ingredients in our case is the data. So our AI wants all the data so that it can learn and experiment with the data to create something that resembles that data. To really train and build a good neural network, the larger your data set, the better. Now, I actually can't name a thousand boy bands from the top of my head. So I kind of asked GPT for help, which, okay, I guess hypocritical of me to ask the AI for help in building AI. But you know, I am just a girl and I also have a job and everything. So I don't have time sitting around researching boy bands all day. I also don't have time for a programming degree, which would have also been helpful at this point. But you know, we take what we can get. Okay, so actually also GPT doesn't know a thousand boy band names because I went through the list and half of them were girl band names, which I guess, okay, very feminist of you, GPT, but we we're trying to stick to the topic here. Um, so yeah, I kind of like redid the whole text file and did this, and then we're going to build up the code based on TensorFlow. Um, so I imported the library into my code and kind of used it to say, okay, here are all these names, go through these names, analyze them, and then build new names based on that. This might sound really weird right now. I, I spent... I spent so many weeks. I mean, basically since my last video, so I, I've been working on this for a month now, trying to get this code to work. Right now, as I sit here, it is still working <laughs> because I am increasing the epoch to have the output be better. An epoch is basically one total turn through the data set. And with each epoch, the model's like quality of output actually increases. So it has to run through a lot and that, that actually takes a long time and like energy as we've been talking about at the beginning of this video. I didn't think even like small experiments like this would need that much time and energy, but they do. Um, and the output at the beginning was very questionable. Like I just got strings of random texts and letters. Um, and I was like, what the hell is this? But of course I can't like expect my AI after just a few rounds of learning to give me full on amazing names, you know? I kind of thought it would be easier, but of course, if I think about a child, it also needs years to learn something. So if I throw something into an algorithm, of course, it also needs time to process and learn. And then in the end, I got a few results that I was actually happy with. Ah! And now we can go to the actual difficult part of this video, the image generating part. <laughs> At first, I want to start training the model again from scratch, like with the text part, um, because somehow I approach everything with unwavering confidence that is based in basically nothing. <laughs> and this also means that I had to train a GAN, or General Advisorial Network, which is what is used at the basis of, I think, most image generators. So what even is a GAN? It's a type of machine learning model where two neural networks, a generator and discriminator, are trained together in a competitive setting. Okay, that is to say, we have a generator that is basically generating our images and a discriminator which is saying this image is a real image or this image is a fake image. While the generator is getting better and better, it is getting harder and harder for the discriminator to distinguish what is real and what is fake. So hopefully one, like sometime, the images get so good that it can't even say if this is real or this is fake. So it's kind of like... It's self-improving algorithm, which is what we want because I don't want to use data from anywhere else. I just want to learn based on my own data. All of this I tested at first with a very small sample and very small image size. So I had like images of clouds. I like made like a whole folder with like 200 cloud images, which were 100 by 100 pixels. So very small because I also learned very quickly that the larger the images, the harder it will be or the longer it will take and generate me new cloud images. You see, this is clouds, these clouds, you know, generate me stuff like this. And then I got amazing output. I got the most beautiful clouds that you have ever seen. I present you clouds by my AI. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't know what I expected. I don't, I mean, like I said, unwavering of confidence. I thought I'm just a genius and this will work and I get beautiful cloud pictures the first try. I didn't get cloud pictures or anything resembling a cloud the first hundred tries. Oh my god, it was so hard because there is obviously so much that goes into it. I mean, so many props to every single like engineer out there or programmer out there or somebody who works with code out there because coding is hard, you know? It's like mathematics and I hate math. I was, it's my worst subject in school. I'm not very good at it. But um, I do have this I can't give up thing. So I couldn't give up. I was like, this has to happen somehow. I mean, people are able to do it. Why should I not be able to do it? So I improved up on my code. I asked communities online to help me a little bit with it. And finally, finally, slowly but surely, my code was generating cloud images or at least cloud resembling images. And I was like, ka-ching, yes. <laughs> 
But also, I mean, I want to generate boy bands, so this is not <laughs> this is not even the goal here. Um, and at this point in time, I was like, okay, it's working. I mean, in theory, I know how this works now, but also clouds are very different from wanting to generate people or have the AI actually learn from boy bands because I don't have the time again to make a data set of over a thousand boy band images. Option B kind of is to use a pre-trained model and to just show it like, okay, these are the kind of images I want to get out of you. You already know how to generate images. And this is the kind of stuff I want. I want boy bands. So that is what I did. Again, am I outsmarting AI by using pre-trained AI in building AI or did I lose in the first place? I still had to build the data set, of course, which yes, I did spend three hours cropping boy band images before learning that actually my code could have cropped them as well. Um, hundreds of boy band images later, here we are. Instead of the GAN, I then used a pre-trained stable diffusion model to generate my images. This actually worked very well the first try. And after seeing the pictures or the boy bands that are generated for me, I truly understand now why some people think AI is art. I present to you the boy bands. Okay, but also to turn it all back around, what I did here isn't actually built an AI. And I think most of you also got that. What I did here is just a basic machine learning algorithm. I mean, machine learning algorithm isn't as much as a buzzword as AI is, even though most things that you see or encounter each day that are claimed to be AI are actually just basic machine learning algorithms. But the term machine learning just isn't as cool as AI. So it has been removed from pop culture vocabulary and we just like to speak in buzzwords. So everything is AI. You know what this experiment inspired in me though? Kind of like childlike wonder, wanting to try out more, wanting to improve the algorithm, wanting it to generate better or funnier pictures. And I think I'm not alone in this feeling because AI art is a big and booming field. And no, I don't mean the Facebook generated AI art of Jesus or big breasted females or whatever's going on down there. No, I mean like actual AI art. Who is smarter, me or AI, is like asking who knows more, me or Google. Obviously the answer is me. AI has access to a huge field of knowledge, but the thing that separates it from humans, they say, is creative problem solving. Creativity has been thought to be human specific, but nowadays AI image generators are popping off like corn. AI is supporting or taking over the film industry with scripting and 3D modeling. And many contemporary artists are starting to work hand in hand with this technology, whilst others are fighting without success against data and art theft. And now let me make a very weird comparison. Do artists deserve more protection in their jobs than factory workers who were made obsolete by automation? Sure, an argument can be made for the fact that artists often hone their craft over many years, but I think what inspires people to defend art or creativity in the face of AI isn't that they are morally more inclined inclined to sympathize with artists, but rather that they see this discussion as an extension of themselves. And if human creativity isn't safe anymore, then no one's job is being safe from being taken over by AI. Ghibli legend Miyazaki was once presented an AI that was starting to learn how to rig bodies so that they move kind of like zombies. Why he was presented this specific AI project, no one knows because this is like the furthest from what I think would be interesting to Miyazaki. And he really didn't like it because he commented, it does not know pain, so it is an insult to life itself. <laughs> I think that is a very strong quote and is often taken as him being very against AI. And while I do not fully agree with this take, I do agree with something that is being said between the lines here. As long as we can, we not only should, but we have to separate ourselves from AI when it comes to creative expression. As long as there is something unique and irreplaceable that humans can provide in artistic endeavors, there will continue to be a market for them. If there isn't, then the problem is no different than any other artisan being replaced by something new. If we decide that a fabricated bowl is worth more than a handcrafted one, if we decide that real wood isn't worth as much as some cheap furniture, then the problem is in our decision on these things as a society and not in the availability of these things on the market. I also think that this progress in technology has the opportunity to create more artists or creators. Like with the invention of the camera that now everybody has on their phone, I think that many more people can decide to create something and share it with their friends and family and that can be a beautiful thing. And a select few might even transcend this and inspire us with the things that they create in a way that is bigger than the thing itself. And that is kind of like how artists have always been born. In my work as an artist and researcher, I explore AI and robotics to develop new processes for human creativity. For the past few years, I've made work alongside machines, data, and emerging technologies. So Wen Chang is a contemporary Canadian AI artist who incorporates AI in her creative process. I believe her work to be really highly inspiring and I encourage you to watch the whole TED talk, but I would think what she said is that she works alongside machines in creating new things as an artist and researcher. And I think the key word really is alongside here. She's not being used by AI, she's using it to her advantage and to create new things. 
things. Another one I want to introduce to you is Refik Anadol, a Turkish-born artist and creator who is using AI to create interactive and immersive installations. He is also using this art to pose a question to all of his viewers and visitors of what is creative and what is real because he really understands how strong AI is in creating visual worlds and how amazing it is and how much more amazing this technology will become. But we as humans have to decide how we look at this then. And I think this is a question that in time will be asked of our whole society. Personally, I'm mesmerized by these types of artworks. I really enjoy them. I think they have a certain kind of aesthetic that I really like. But I also think that when working with AI, you have a certain kind of responsibility as an artist to disclose what is AI, where you took your data from, and to really act responsibly with this whole technology. Because we don't want art from other artists being stolen just for the sake of you creating something new. So if it is not creativity that sets us apart, nor is it knowledge or decision making, then what will it be? What can our brains do that an artificial neural network cannot do? During my research, I actually only found one answer that I could really agree with. What sets human beings apart is our doubt. Being able to admit when we are wrong. And I know that this is hard for some of us. But have you ever heard of an AI admitting, no, I actually don't know? Often it's actually the opposite. Like even when an AI does know the answer, it will confidently spit out something that they think is right. The concept of metacognition, thinking about one's own thinking, is thus a defining feature of human self-awareness, something that AI right now cannot do. Oh my God, I never thought that it would be my anxiety and overthinking that separates me from AI. <laughs> and sure, nobody knows what will happen in the future. AI might progress even more and become more human than humans, to quote the crazy quote from the beginning. If and when the time comes, I think it will be our responsibility to create a new morality to deal with these issues, to really ask ethical questions about it. I have a quote here from Joanna Matijewska. I'm sorry, I'm probably pronouncing this wrong. You know what the biggest problem with pushing all things AI is? Wrong direction. I want AI to do my laundry and dishes so that I can do art and writing, not for the AI to do my art and writing so that I can do my laundry and dishes. And even without AGI being right around the corner, we didn't really touch on many of the ethical and moral dilemmas that already come into play with present AI. Ethical decision making is an intricate process deeply rooted in human values, culture and empathy, something which AI currently lacks. They may produce biased or unfair results if trained on biased or unfair data. I mean, remember Tay AI from Microsoft, which was trained on Twitter and became racist in like under 24 hours? Logically, this means, of course, that humans have to play a pivotal role in overseeing AI systems. The problem with this though is of course that no two humans have the same set of morals and one could even argue that imposing our morality on a machine that is beginning to form its own set of morals is hypocritical in its own way. During my coding experiment I wrote down some things that I did wrong and compiled some of it here for you. I've installed the wrong Python version multiple times and up with an x86 Python in a MacBook that it needed an ARM one. I had to learn how to correctly use homebrew, wrestle with virtual environments, now know what normalizing an image means and came into contact with sigmoid functions and more. To say it was a struggle would be an understatement, but I think it was a welcome one. I've decided for myself that I do enjoy what this technology has to offer, and I have many ideas for works that could benefit from exploring it. I will continue to use AI for my artistic endeavors or just ideas or just for fun, but I do want to use it responsibly. And I think we as a society are at a pivotal point in time right now where we really have to ask ourselves how we want to engage with AI and the things that it creates, and how we want to value them compared to things that humans do create. I think these are all questions that should be asked right now and not 10 years in the future when it will be too late and AI will have taken over already. I also do think that AI has the possibility to become more human than humans, but I don't think it will be happening as fast as some of the Silicon Valley people are making it out to be. I think it will be a long, long slope in time and maybe when I'm 100 I will still be around to see it or maybe not, who knows, you know? I think by this time humans might have already destroyed themselves with another nuclear war or something. That will happen probably before the AI takes over. Okay, this is a really dark note to end this video on. For now, I do want to say thank you to everybody who stuck around so long and who watched this whole video through. Um, I do enjoy exploring weird topics like this and I really had fun exploring AI even though my brain now feels like it's burning and I'm so ready to finally delete all of these codes from my computer because my desktop is looking like, I don't know, I'm starting to hack into the uh, CIA or something. As always, I hope you have a nice day, nice night, nice midday, wherever you are and finally back on my channel. Oops, I have like a cooling thing behind my camera because uh, it is so hot that it will always shut off. <laughs> okay, bye. Thank you.